Okay, well, first of all, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to be here in Vegas for my first time. Really exciting, obviously, to be in Vegas. People think it's because of the gambling and the partying, but really, of course, obviously, everybody here knows. Excited about Vegas because it's the place where Murray Rothbard wrote most of his work because he used to teach here, right? Yes. <laughs> sure. Well, anyways, uh, the title of my talk was supposed to be the Bitcoin Standard, and uh, Tone and I had discussed what part of my book should I focus on and discuss. But over the last couple of days, it became clear to me it would probably be a better idea to just not talk about the book um, because people would, you know, a lot of the attendees here have heard um, me speak before or have read it. So I thought I would instead talk about the sort of things, the work that I've been doing after the book and um, the new research that I've done. So most of you might not be very familiar with these. I chose three specific topics that I have um, been um, researching for the uh, subscription research service, which I'll talk about a little in, uh, in a little bit. Um, the first one is possible scenarios for Bitcoin. The second one contains, uh, concerns Bitcoin's energy consumption. And the third one concerns uh, fiat food and fiat money and the link between the two and sort of explains the link between Bitcoin and meat and carnivores and, you know, the dinner that we had um, two nights ago. It's not just a meme, in my opinion. I think there's a very strong c correlation and connection between those two. So I'm going to talk a little bit in brief about a lot of these topics, and then hopefully we can have a discussion about them uh, in the Q&A and throughout the rest of the day. So uh, first of all, in terms of thinking about, you know, my book explained how I see Bitcoin functionally um, operating as a settlement layer on top of which there will be built uh, solutions for uh, individual and consumer payments. Um, but, you know, it left it open how that is going to come about, whether it's going to be government-run, whether it's going to be a free market institution, or what the uh, government has done about it. And, you know, it left it deliberately open because my the point of my book was not to make predictions um, about how things unfold, and particularly because, you know, in issues of human action in which humans are acting um, in order to shape uh, the future, it's very hard to make concrete predictions about how uh, things turn out. It usually ends up being embarrassing. So I skipped it from the book, but I couldn't help myself and embarrass myself later on by beginning to dig into this and trying to think about ways in which this could come about. And essentially, these are six main scenarios that I, uh, that I find um, possible for understanding how a Bitcoin standard could evolve uh, from now on. So first of all, um, the most common one that people think of, uh, I think, might be the notion that central banks are just going to adopt Bitcoin. You know, one day they'll have an agreement and they take over Bitcoin. And I think this one is highly unlikely to happen. Um, it, you know, the, the subtitle of my book was Bitcoin, uh, the Bitcoin standard, the decentralized alternative to central banking. So I don't think Bitcoin is just going to leave central banking as it is, but just replace the asset on, on which it um, settles. I think ultimately it's going to change that. And I don't think governments and central banks are going to be um, likely to adopt Bitcoin any, at any point in time. Because I think while there is a case to be made that these uh, central banks might, for instance, uh, hate the dollar or they hate other people's currencies. But if you work at a central bank, you are extremely wedded to the idea of government control over money. And so the notion of Bitcoin, of apolitical money, doesn't make sense. They will be the last people to get it because they are... Oh, absolutely. I'm sorry. Sorry about this. They will be the absolute last people to get it because essentially um, their entire worldview is built on the idea that government is what determines what money is. And so the notion that they will buy into it, I think, is, is, is quite fanciful. Also, you know, uh, it, it's, a serious, uh, it's a serious defiance of American hegemony, which usually doesn't end very well. So don't hold, uh, d don't hold much hopes for that, in my opinion. The second opinion, which I think many, uh, the second scenario, which I think many uh, Bitcoiners, um, and particularly libertarians, um, wish for or believe in or in some ways um, think of like the rapture, is the idea that, you know, we're going to have hyper-Bitcoinization one day and all the other currencies are going to collapse to zero and the whole world will be like Venezuela and only Bitcoiners will eat. 
and then we can laugh at all the people that have been laughing at us for all these years and get vindication. And, you know, sounds like a nice idea, but I think there's, there's, uh, th there are good reasons to believe that um, hyperinflation of fiat currencies is not a necessary outcome of Bitcoin's rise. In other words, we'll see hyperinflations like we do in Venezuela right now, and Bitcoin could play a role in these uh, situations, and people will use it. But it's not Bitcoin that's bringing about hyperinflation in Venezuela. It's the, the, the Venezuelan government increasing the money supply through many different ways. So um, I think the problem with this is that the analysis that generally assumes this will happen looks at money and currency from the demand side only. And so the idea is, if people are going to start holding more Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin is going to go up, and then they're going to hold and demand less um, fiat currency, so the value of that currency will go down. But what is missing from that analysis is the supply side. And if you, um, you, know, if you study how a modern fiat currency is created, it is created through the creation of debt, whether it's government debt or banking sector debt. With the creation of new debt, new money is created. Uh, that's the essential thing to understand about how the current monetary system functions. So, in the case of the rise of Bitcoin, not only will demand for Bitcoin likely, uh, not only will uh, demand for dollars and fiat currencies decline, but also the supply, because people are likely to also start borrowing less in uh, Bitcoin, in, in, a, in a world in which Bitcoin is a bigger part of the economy. So, you know, as people start being able to save in Bitcoin and, you know, they move towards a hard economy and a hard uh, money, um, you know, the, the, remember the discussion of time preference in my book, the desire to borrow re is reduced and the incentive to save is increased. And so people are more likely to be saving rather than borrowing. And so what this will lead to is not just an increase in... Um, Sorry, not just a decrease in the demand for dollars, but also a decrease in the supply for dollars. And essentially, central banks have gotten, some of them at least, you know, superficially at least, pretty good at managing prices and statistics, which, you know, are grades that they give themselves, um, essentially, because they invented all these measures. They're pretty good at managing perceptions around um, this kind of scenario and not letting it unfold drastically badly, like in Venezuela, since the 1980s at least. They've learned some tricks. So it could be that you know, they could manage this sort of decline of the currency. And essentially, if you think about it, this could effectively work as a giant global debt jubilee. In other words, we move towards Bitcoin, um, not through the world collapsing, but through the world you know, essentially upgrading from one monetary operating system to another, one person at a time. And the difference, another reason why it's different from the situation of hyperinflation is that in the case of hyperinflation, it only happens obviously with government monopoly money. And government monopoly money means that government prevents any other kind of monetary asset from playing the role of money within the economy. And so when the government's currency collapses, you know, there's no more monetary system available for people to use. And so the economy goes back to a system of basic barter and you know, massive inefficiency, and that's the disaster of hyperinflation. So the, uh, the difference between that and with Bitcoin is that with Bitcoin, we're not going to be essentially leaving anybody behind. In a sense, anyone who wants to move to Bitcoin can move towards Bitcoin and start using it, and um, that doesn't necessarily lead to a collapse of fiat currency. It just dwindles in importance and dwindles in size and dwindles in value as people and individuals and institutions are essentially able to pay off their debts in that world as they move on towards Bitcoin. And I think it's, a, it's an interesting scenario to think about it because effectively, Bitcoin by being this market-driven monetization asset, it, it, in a sense of, you know, it, 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 it became a monetary asset and it went through this process of monetization where it's increasing in its value as a monetary asset. It's essentially a market solution to the problem of the absence of a hard monetary asset in the current uh, global financial system. And so, effectively, it could function in a way that treats the symptoms of the absence of hard money in terms of the excessive credit um, that everybody is um, 
saddled with as individuals and institutions and even um, you know all levels of government so effectively it you know it doesn't have to be um, a hollywood uh, apocalyptic movie it it might just be all roses and rainbows all along the way uh, to the moon it doesn't have to <laughs> it doesn't have to be bad i think that's that, that that's you know I think the best metaphor to think of that is that uh, imagine the current monetary system is like a big giant house of cards of debt and you know 2008 it came close to falling apart you know one solution for it is to have a collapse like 2008 clean the whole thing and then we start a clean slate but it seems like bitcoin by essentially appreciating in the market is like somebody taking apart the house of cards without letting it fall apart you know you take out two cards together at the same time that are supporting each other, and then the rest don't fall, and two at a time, and then the whole thing essentially, you know, is packed away and put back into the cards deck, and you know, the house of cards is over peacefully without having to cause uh, much damage. I think that's something worth considering and thinking about. The other scenario in which you know we don't end up with a um, mass adoption of Bitcoin as a monetary standard, but Bitcoin doesn't die is one in which you know we sort of continue in the current status quo for another you know few decades or centuries in which essentially bitcoin um you know doesn't gain mass adoption for whatever reason but um continues to exist as a viable option for people in any country where there's going to be hyperinflation or inflation and so people um as soon as a central bank starts inflating their currency too much people start jumping to bitcoin that devalues the currency for the central bank a lot. And then, you know, if they don't learn their lesson, their currency collapses. So effectively, Bitcoin exists there to just, you know, be in the nightmares of central banks and make sure that they behave. That's one possibility. And, you know, it could be that the threat of Bitcoin ends up forcing central banks to get their act together well enough that you end up with more sort of sane monetary policy eventually allowing, uh, you know, making the demand for Bitcoin uh, as an alternative to the current monetary system decline significantly. But it would still continue to exist as this kind of uh, monetary asset. That's one way of thinking of it. And then two uh, even worse scenarios. So, you know, people always accuse us maximalists of only re reporting rainbows and lambos and moon and roses and everything is glorious in our you know, republic under our glorious leader, Adam Back. But let's maybe, uh, <laughs> let's maybe sit back a little bit and think of possible failure scenarios or how things could go bad for Bitcoin. And in my book, I mentioned that the best way to kill Bitcoin, you know, there, when people discuss how Bitcoin could be killed, they talk about 51% attack and they talk about um, compromising nodes and social attacks and all sorts of different things. But in my book, I argue those things are, you know, they, they have the deck stacked against them effectively because they, um, you know, they're temporary solutions to economic um, actions that people are doing. And so they don't alter economic incentives. And as long as people have an economic incentive to do something, they will do it and they will find a way. So, you know, even if you shut down the internet in an entire country, people will use Gotenna or whatever. And, you know, every 10 minutes will reach consensus over one or two megabytes of data. It, 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 it's pretty simple uh, to achieve technically because there is a very strong incentive economically for people to do it. So in my book, I say, you know, if you want to actually kill Bitcoin, what would work is to try and undermine that economic incentive. And so that would be pretty simple and straightforward, but not easy at all, which is a return to a gold standard. If we had... Um, a free market in money and banking, and government would not interfere in money and banking. I think that would seriously undermine the demand for Bitcoin. And it's a question that's worth exploring, and I, I am, um, you know, this, I'm working on, on this and writing about it right now. What would happen in a, um, in a, if we had that kind of gold standard to demand for Bitcoin? It would arguably decline. You know, if we had a global gold standard similar to the one that existed in 1900, for instance, you would expect that, you know, there would be no more um, Zimbabwe's and Venezuela's and Turkey and Iran uh, experiencing all of this fast uh, inflation driving up uh, more demand for Bitcoin. And how much would that make a difference? It, it would be really interesting to examine it. And uh, 
And then there's the other scenario, which is imagine scenario number two comes true, and you know we have hyper Bitcoinization and we all dance on the graves of all fiat currencies and live happily ever after initially. But then um, I was thinking of it in, 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 in a sense, um, Bitcoin is optimized for one thing only, and that is resisting capture by the modern state. That's it. It's a creature that's optimized for that. It's not optimized for your consumer experience. As you may have noticed, <laughs> it's not optimized for speed. It's not op optimized for you know uh, buying your coffee. It's optimized for not being controlled by a government. That's really what it does best. So now imagine a situation in which governments are no longer able to interfere in monetary standards and monetary affairs. And that if this were to happen tomorrow, you know, if all these currencies were to collapse tomorrow, we live in a world in which the sort of, you know, the market cap of gold is around 100 times larger than that of Bitcoin. And so it's, it, it's not straightforward in that kind of world if there's no more government control and restriction over gold, that um, gold would not emerge as a monetary standard. You know, digital mechanisms for clearance of gold um, backed by physical gold in a, in a free market for these, uh, for, for these kinds of instruments. I think this is a scenario worth considering and thinking about. Uh, digital gold is, you know, there are many reasons why you would expect that it would be um, better maybe for um, modern consumers. What's going on? Well, where were we? Did somebody uh, get the laptop? No? So I think, you know, this is, this is a general uh, idea about these six different scenarios that I was discussing with regards to how uh, Bitcoin can uh, continue. And so, um, uh, this is um, th this is the first topic that I wanted to talk about. For the second one, uh, the one, and one of the main topics, uh, one of the topics for the research bulletins that I've been writing was on Bitcoin's energy consumption. So I've um, I've looked into that and written extensively about it. And there's a few points uh, that I wanted to emphasize about um, the impact that Bitcoin will have on energy. So generally, of course, you know, in, in in mainstream media, when you read about Bitcoin and energy, it's always about how you know it's bitcoin is consuming more than ireland or denmark or poland or turkey in electricity and how this is a horrible thing because you know poland what are we going to do how are we going to take away all the electricity for bitcoin you know it's so sad we shouldn't uh, but of course that's not really how energy works and i think the key distinction that people miss is that uh, the mainstream perspective on energy is um is this idea that it is a finite resource that exists out there and that we're consuming out of it and we're taking out little chunks of it every, um, every time we choose to do anything. Um, but the reality of what energy is, is that energy is something that is produced. The amount of energy that is potentially available for us on this planet is essentially infinite. You know, the amount of solar energy that hits the earth every day every day is hundreds of times larger than the entire annual consumption of the entire planet. And the wind energy and the um, uh, fossil fuel energy, the, non the nuclear energy, the amount of resources we have for energy is enormous. And the challenge with energy is not about how much of these things we have. It's about being able to utilize these things in the time and place at which we want to utilize them. That's the tricky part about it. And this is, you know, th th there's no energy crisis. You know, if you look at places like uh, the north of Canada, the amount of energy that could be generated there from all kinds of different um, sources of energy is multiples of um, the entire energy production of the entire planet. But the reason it's not being produced is that there's no demand for investing all the infrastructure that would be needed in these areas. So what Bitcoin does in the energy market is, is truly, I think, going to be remarkable and transformative because it is effectively allowing us a mechanism for transferring uh, and producing and selling 
electricity and energy everywhere across the world, um, cre essentially creating a liquid market in electricity and energy. Because now you can go to all of these areas where you have massive resources of energy, where there's no incentive to invest there because there's no um, commercial or residential or industrial facilities that are close to it, and there's a massive uh, initial capital expenditure needed to produce these things. Um, these areas can finance their capital expenditure because now they can monetize the large sources of energy with essentially very small capital expenditures initially. And particularly, this is true for hydroelectric uh, generators. And this is why I think, you know, it's, it's, it's not obviously easy to survey Bitcoin miners, but a lot of evidence suggests more and more of Bitcoin mining is being attached to hydroelectric because hydroelectric power is usually most concentrated in areas that have regular flooding. So these are areas in which uh, people don't really settle. People settle a little bit far away from that. So that makes utilizing that energy pretty tricky. But Bitcoin can be used to finance the initial capital investment for that. And then that, I think, is going to lead to more and more development of um, energy infrastructure around the places where it is needed the most. And so the impact for this is, you know, it's Bitcoin is providing a market for anyone who can produce energy anywhere in the world to profit from it. So what do you think that's going to do to the production of energy? It's going to increase it massively. And so when people talk about how Bitcoin is consuming more and more electricity, they are essentially missing the point because the only way you can consume that electricity is if you're providing the uh, financial compensation for the people who are producing it. Therefore, Bitcoin is massively financing investment in energy and in energy production. And so if Bitcoin continues to increase its energy consumption more and more, it's just going to finance more and more of these um, large facilities that are arguably going to be concentrated in stranded areas, you know, energy sources that are in stranded areas away from, uh, away from large concentrations. And so um, and another way of thinking of it is that it's going to make energy subsidies extremely difficult to enforce. As we started seeing in many countries that, have, that offer low electricity rates, what ended up happening is that people who are able to get these subsidies, you know, government employees or people who work for the electricity authority um, or, you know, well-connected politicians, they started using these rates to mine Bitcoin. But that's just never going to be sustainable because if you're able to make money from, un from you know, subsidized electricity, you're just going to keep making more and more of it until you bankrupt the people providing you the, subsi the subsidized electricity. You know, now there's essentially a leak in all electric productions where if anyone is selling their electricity at an inefficient rate, at a low rate, a rate lower than the market, they're just pouring money into that leak until they run out of money. And so I think over time it's going to lead to governments having to liberalize the market in electricity and energy because it's going to become harder and harder to control energy um, production because you know not only are you going to get a more distributed infrastructure for the production of energy, you're also going to get a more liquid market in this. And I think you know, the, the, the benefits of that in terms of efficiency are likely to be enormous. So that's in terms of the energy market. And then finally, the issue of uh, fiat money and fiat food. Um, you know, nutrition is, a, is another topic that is um, similar to economics in terms of you know, there being a, a prevalent dogma that everybody believes and then there's a bunch of outlaws. And so in economics, you know, we have Ludwig von Mises and Money Rothbard and all these uh, good people. But in nutrition, they have a guy called Weston Price. And, you know, if you want to spend, uh, if you want to learn a lot of things over the next six months, start Googling Weston Price and start reading his books and reading books written about him and so on. So the guy is essentially the complete opposite of um, the modern nutrition that is taught in uh, modern universities. And he performed a, 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 a remarkable experiment that arguably can't ever be repeated, which is at the beginning of the invention of flight in the 1920s and 30s, he traveled the whole world. He traveled all over the world, the Pacific, uh, Europe, Africa, um, the Arctic. Um, he traveled most regions of the world, uh, traveling to isolated areas, looking at what, what uh, the isolated tribes that have not uh, 
uh, tribes and villages and societies had not started eating industrial food, um, what they were eating and comparing it to places with where um, people were eating, you know, people were similar genetically, but they were eating more modern industrial food. And the results of his research are absolutely stunning because, you know, you see people from all kinds of races from all over the world and you see the same relationship, which is when they eat the traditional food that has been prepared according to traditional ways, people are healthy and they don't have any of the modern diseases that we take for granted. And then when they start eating flour and sugar and processed industrial foods, that's when all of these diseases happen. So. Of course, this is a very unpopular message, as you would imagine, in um, universities because the people who pay the bills of the university professors are exactly the producers of all of this uh, industrial uh, food that is highly toxic. So the point of all of this is that the linkage, um, if, you, if you think about the problem of nutrition in terms of um, obesity, many people think of obesity as being a sign of affluence, that people are just too rich and they can eat so much. But in fact, the problem of obesity in the modern world is really a symptom of malnutrition. Obesity is what the body does when it's not being fed well enough. And what Weston Price found is that all cultures all over the world, if they eat anything, it's always cooked with animal products, animal, um, animal meat, animal protein, and animal fat. These are the essential nutrients that all cultures relied upon. And with industrialization, they started moving away from these towards industrial uh, foods, and that's what caused the deterioration of health. And that was 100 years ago. So, you know, he didn't see Twinkies and uh, all of the stuff that you see in your supermarket today. He was writing purely just about processed wheat and so on. Um, but the point is that if you think about uh, once, once you understand the issues of economics from his perspective, and you start thinking about foods versus um, as being, you know, the industrial foods that can be used, can be produced with massive industrial power, which can scale massively with the application of industrial technology and energy, versus the foods that are actually nutritious that can be prepared in the traditional manner that takes a lot of time and they can't really scale for mass production, you see that effectively in the 20th century, what has happened is that governments have done their best, in particular the American government, to shift people from eating you know, what was traditionally nutritious food in every culture, as Weston Price showed, towards eating cheap filler, essentially, that makes inflation look low. And you know, the substitution of um, nutritious food with cheap industrial food is is a great way of making it look like the price of food has not gone up. So, um, you know, the way that they calculate the CPI is essentially um, inherently um, uh, invalid, effectively, because it calculates the value of the consumer goods that people are buying based on how much people are spending on these consumer goods. Um, but if the price of these consumer goods goes up significantly, people are still going to be spending the same amount of money, they're just going to be buying inferior uh, goods compared to the ones that they bought before. So if you assume that, you know, a ribeye is just the same thing, just another form of lunch as a soy burger, then, you know, you could say that the price hasn't really gone up much more because inflation doesn't look too bad when you're going from the price of a ribeye over 10 years to a soy burger. But that's essentially what has happened in terms of both the dietary recommendation that government has told people to eat and the massive amount of subsidies that has been given to all of these industrial foods in order to bring the price of food down. In particular, you might want to check out a guy called Earl Butts, who was known as King Corn. He was the Secretary of Agriculture under Nixon. And you know, under Nixon, when they went off the gold standard, that's when prices of everything started to go up. So effectively, the way that they fought inflation was by having Earl Butts industrialize um, agriculture in order to use massive amounts of energy, bringing the prices down and making, um, you know, making the new form of stuff that they were producing into just the food that everybody eats. And so after they go off the gold standard, we start getting the dietary guidelines that tell people, you know, meat is bad for you and you should eat more. Um, uh, plant sources of protein and plant fats and so on. And so, you know, with, with all of these changes, the move from animal protein towards plant protein, the move from animal fat towards plant fat, you're, you're using uh, modern industrialization in a very heavy way in order to try and make these foods slightly edible. And it's something that was not done 
before, and it's extremely deleterious to people's health. And I think it's it, the, the, the driver of it has to at least to some extent be uh, the monetary policy that is involved. I think this is uh, basically it um, for what I had been uh, planning to discuss. So what I'm doing right now after uh, publishing the book, you know, if you'd like to see another book, if you want me to write faster, subscribe harder. The more you subscribe, the more words keep coming out. It's been quite effective. Over the last four months, I've cranked out about 40,000 words on these uh, topics. So um, I, the plan is essentially to um, offer these as a monthly subscription service and then over time refine them and edit them and eventually uh, publish them in another book. So if you don't want to subscribe, you can just keep your time preference low, wait a few months and you'll be able to buy it as a book from Amazon. But, you know, if your time preference is high, which is, you know, it's okay. Time preference is always positive. It doesn't, it's never zero and it can't be negative then you might want to subscribe to hasten the process of production of the book. Also, I think um, the other thing that I plan on doing now is uh, I'd like to start making uh, Austrian economics courses and to teach them online, um, essentially uh, going around the entire university structure and just teaching directly to students. So uh, if interested in this, keep your eyes out on Twitter and all sorts of things. Over the next few weeks, I will be announcing this in detail. But effectively, I'm planning on doing video lectures that you can download and then seminars of only eight students um, from, you know, people can join from all over the world. And uh, we'd have a seminar discussing the readings once a week um, for about eight weeks per semester or something like that is the initial plan. So it's roughly one hour uh, a week for eight weeks as a seminar or something like that. Th these are my initial plans and this is what I pl basically plan on uh, working on um, after uh, the book. So thank you very much everybody for listening and I'm happy to take your questions. I say thanks for being here, awesome. Uh, um, on your possible scenarios for Bitcoin, the things that I, okay, um, the possible scenarios, um, things that I think are probably most likely, uh, the vigilante scenario, which I think will be fine, store value will be maintained, but on your smooth upgrade scenario, talk about the uh, decline in demand. Uh, the elephant in the room is the unfunded pension liabilities in the United States, hundreds of trillions of dollars for all these governments. Um, what effect will that have on the demand for U.S. dollars because as these people age, they're going to demand those dollars in fiat, correct, through the systems? But also, as people age, they're going to start becoming, uh, in the case in which Bitcoin gains an adoption, people are going to be more reliant on their Bitcoin savings than their um, welfare payments, which I think the key thing to understand is that, you know, the experience of the Soviet Union um, in central planning shows that you can get away effectively with a socket puppet economy for, with, you know, manufactured numbers for quite a while. And you could fool people quite significantly for a while, you know. Um, I remember sharing this, the most, the most influential macroeconomics textbook in the world is Samuelson's textbook and Nordhaus is his co-author. And in 1989, before the, uh, before, the, uh, before the Soviet Union collapsed by about a year, that textbook's edition said that the Soviet Union will be overtaking the US economy within uh, 10 or 15 years or something like that. So uh, from that perspective, you know, you can continue to fool people with these kinds of numbers. And I think essentially what's going to happen to the, um, uh, if Bitcoin continues to rise, what's going to happen to the um, government money-based economy is that the value of the um, currency will be controlled closely by central banks that effectively are owning more and more of the capital structure of the economy and centrally plan more of the prices of the economy. But we're going to see a continuation of what I was discussing in terms of food. So, you know, you'll be getting paid your entitlements and they'll entitle you to buy health care, but the quality of the health care is going to decline um, incredibly. And so you're going to be reliant on your uh, Bitcoins, essentially. I, th I think this, this is how it uh, would likely unfold, I think. Hey, um, so I want to ask about what you think about uh, the risk of the gold standard coming back, uh, if that's really 
more of a short-term problem because of the uh, drastically decreasing inflation of Bitcoin and um, the fact that we'll have you know, about 99% of total supply within a little over a decade. Um, and if, if you think that just the, the sheer hardness of Bitcoin once we get just over the hump of lower inflation than gold will will change that thing. You know, I'm not entirely sure because uh, essentially, you know, gold has like a 6,000 year first mover advantage. It has been building its liquidity pool for 6,000 years. And so um, it's, um, it's, it's not a foregone conclusion that um, having a 0.01% supply growth rate is that much different and better than having a 1% supply growth rate. It might be that the physical familiarity of gold and the fact that the market cap essentially of the gold that's out there is you know, about 100 times larger than Bitcoin, it might just be an insurmountable um, gap. So you know, network effects just means everybody's still on gold and everybody sticks to gold. And effectively, <coughs> there's not much reason for uh, abandoning gold in a world in which there's a free market to build on gold. I think that's, that's really the key issue. Yeah. Yes. Hey, great job. Um, I had a quick question. Um, in the case where central banks do become less relevant or um, entirely collapse, uh, do, I think the question of are coders fiduciaries becomes more relevant. And uh, Angela Walsh has spoken about it, and she's talked about how we mistakenly think it's trust minimizing, but it's actually trust shifting. So you trust that you know, like Matt Corallo and like Peter aren't going to go rogue and like uh, just push, um, you know bunch of like bug written code. So I'm curious how you think about uh, the coders or fiduciaries argument. I mean, I think ultimately the problem with that is that, you know, coders can be anonymous and then it's hard to establish um, whose liability it is. But ultimately the liability, anybody is free to put out any software that they want. It's on you whether you choose to run it and adopt it. And I think legally, I'm, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, um, but you know, that's never really stopped anyone. Uh, talking about these things anyway, so might as well, you asked. Uh, I think, you know, the issue is that, you know, you could create malware and uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. People can create software that can create problems and it might serve purposes at certain points in time. But, you know, deceiving somebody and installing it on their computer without their knowledge, that's the problem. And so, unless, you know, uh, Peter and Matt go rogue enough to be installing uh, software on your node without you knowing it. I think ultimately, you know, you chose to run that software. I, so I think, you know, you accept the responsibility, you're free to run the code as you want. And so therefore, I, I, I struggle to see how you could enforce it, particularly as it becomes, it's almost trivial to establish anonymity, you know. It, it, it's very easy for somebody to do all the work and then just post it under somebody else's uh, under some anonymous handle um, and then just disappear. So I don't know. That's what I would say. Yes. All right. Thanks. Uh, so my, <clears throat> my question is um, there are two new Mimblewimble blockchains that came out. One's one is Beam and it features the blockchain or the Bitcoin style um, happening. And then the other one, Grin, has the linear inflation. And um, having studied this a lot, I wanted to get your thoughts on um, the, the advantages of, of the way Grin does it is that inflation can always, inflation always, the inflation rate always goes down. So I'm wondering if uh, 10 years later, if Satoshi were doing it over, or maybe Satoshi is behind the Mimble Wimble paper, who knows? Um, but uh, can you speak to the differences in long term impact of the monetary supply? Um, of the two different models, the you know exponential decay yeah. versus linear. Well, I think I think the important thing about uh, the monetary policy is not the exact parameters. Um, ultimately, both of these, if you have a continuous growth in the same stock, you're going to trend towards a fixed supply, um, and you're going to tend towards it also, even if you have a decreasing, uh, even if you have a halvening. So, with a halvening or without a halvening, we would tend towards a zero percent growth rate. Um, the, the, the important thing about Bitcoin is not so much the low numbers, it's the fact that these numbers are immutable. It's the fact that nobody can change them. That's really why it matters. So ultimately, I think, you know, even if you, let's say Bitcoin was done where there was no halving. So right now the growth supply rate, I think would have been something like 15% because, you know, we'd still be producing 50 uh, coins per uh, block every 10 minutes. 
So the inflation rate would be still higher today, but that doesn't mean, in my opinion, that a new altcoin is necessarily going to be better if it has um, gone down to, let's say, 10% inflation rate by now, because it's not just about the supply growth rate, it's about you know whether that supply can't be altered. Because if one of these coins it starts beginning to attract more and more um, monetary demand, there's going to be a lot of pressure on people to find ways of, you know, making more of it and bailing out people who get into trouble, like we've seen with certain uh, blockchains. So ultimately, I think it's, it, what matters is just the inability to credibly demonstrate immutability. And that's, I think, the, the main issue that makes the, the, the technical parameters not that important. Yes. Um, I'm fascinated by uh, your point about the energy production and energy con consumption. I uh, spend a lot of time in uh, Boston, which is a very leftist uh, city, and uh, pe when people hear about Bitcoin, they're thinking about, oh, this is going to ruin the environment. So I really think what you said about the energy production is fascinating, and you were talking about hydroelectric. And I would say uh, also with solar power, one of the things that people don't consider about solar power is that it produces electricity, a lot of electricity during times of the day when people um, are, you know, they're not necessarily, you know, at home turning on their lights and turning on, and they're not, they're not in front of their, you know, computers at home at night watching TV and stuff like that. So a lot of the energy consumption is after the sun sets. Uh, so I would think that, uh, what do you think about possibly solar power also being a good one? Because then you can, you could mine, you know, during the day. It doesn't matter if you're mining in, in the day and at the night. The problem with solar power is essentially that it's low power. Um, it's it's an energy um, source that is, uh, you know, it goes for a very long time during the day if it's very sunny, but it's not. It's hard to concentrate it into uh, uh, applications that require a lot of power. So, I, I I don't really think that it's going to be very important in Bitcoin mining. I think things like hydroelectric are just much better hands down, and solar panels are much more expensive uh, to run. Uh, that's my hunch. Yes. Uh, well, a quick follow-up. Uh, wouldn't Bitcoin mining uh, potentially allow us to harness solar power in space and beam the Bitcoins back to Earth with solar satellites? And the question I was going to originally ask was, in the event of a gold standard, we'd still have entirely censorable and confiscatable money. And therefore, do you think Bitcoin could still thrive have a you know in the marketplace with a gold standard i mean that's that's the tough thing about this scenario because it assumes that you know not only are governments going to completely repent of a century of keynesian sins but also they're going to repent and actually stick to it you know not just repent for a couple of days and then get back to it and you know i wouldn't advise you to bet on it uh, heavily that's what i would say but you know, it's worth thinking about these kinds of exercises to just think about different possibilities. And who knows, things might change. Okay, okay thank you very much, guys. All right, safe.